Hi everyone, welcome to CSACon. Tell you what, Berlin's amazing. So, really excited to be here. Thank you so much for joining our session. So we're gonna go over collaborative cybersecurity and how we can build stronger solutions together. My name is Heidi Bronson. I am the Partner Security Solutions Software Engineer for SUSE. Uh, Brad Solar, co-founder, CTO of Mainsail. So for our agenda today, we're gonna go over kind of the cyber threat landscape, just a high level overview. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the importance of partnerships within this landscape, and then kind of dive into how we can revolutionize security through our partnerships. Then of course, if there's any questions or answer or questions um, afterwards, we'll go ahead and be happy to answer them. So first, let's go over the cyber threat landscape. So many people have heard of what is known as the butterfly effect. So it's a part of the chaos theory that states that a seemingly insignificant events can have far-reaching consequences on other parts of complex systems. This is very similar to how a butterfly flapping its wings on one side of the world can lead to a series of events that causes a hurricane on the other side of the world. Now this is very true in cybersecurity because we deal with a lot of very complex systems. So in the context of cybersecurity, this kind of explains how a small vulnerability, mistake, or an attack can lead to a devastating attack on all the other parts of the system. And there's several different ex examples of this that we've seen over the years. So in 2017, um, an Amazon Web Services employee was trying to debug their billing system. Uh, they meant to bring down a small number of servers, but a simple typo caused a large number of servers to be brought down. So this ended up causing an outage in the internet for approximately four hours that a lot of people relied on. So according to Seyuns, which was a company that kind of estimated the economy risks of cyber attacks, they estimated that S&P 500 companies lost approximately $150 million in that four hours. And US financial companies lost approximately $160 million. In 2019, of course, we had the SolarWinds attack. Many people have heard of that one. In that one, hackers put in malicious code into SolarWinds Orion framework, which ended up infecting more than 18,000 of their customers. Unfortunately, this attack went undetected for at least two years and ended up causing irreparable damages worth billions of dollars. A more recent event, in 2024, earlier this year, there was a ransomware attack on Change Healthcare. This ended up causing the US healthcare system to be almost paralyzed for several months. Unfortunately, doctors weren't getting paid, procedures were put on hold, and patients were forced to pay out of pocket for their prescriptions. And this was especially devastating for patients that relied on their uh, prescriptions in order to save their life. For example, type, people with type 1 diabetes, transplant patients. And this one affected my family as well. So my youngest son had a heart transplant in December of 2023. And when this attack occurred, he was on 11 different medications. When we tried to get one of them filled, it was $5,000 for one 30-day supply. How do you do that for 11 different medications? But yeah, how do you not? And so it's devastating how many people these attacks affect. But it's because our, our whole infrastructure is so interconnected. We have so many different advanced technologies and it's only continuing to grow. You know, it's great. We have wearable technology, you know, smart glasses, smart watches, pacemakers that can be programmed from pretty much anywhere, AI, cloud computing, electric vehicles. I mean, you can go on and on. And it's so convenient, right? At the touch of our fingertips, we can pay our bills, purchase things, check on our loved one's locations, check our security cameras in our homes. But the problem is, is every single one of those is a target. 
because if we can access all that stuff on our phones, a criminal can as well. And it's very, very devastating. And of course, attackers take advantage of every single challenge that we have. Here's an interesting fact. There is about 15 bugs per thousand lines of code that actually get pu pushed to production. So let's see, an average vehicle, not even an electric vehicle, just an average vehicle has more than a million lines of code. So that's what, 1.5 million potential bugs? An Android operating system has more than 12 million lines of code. It's more than 180,000 bugs. Now, thankfully, not all of those are exploitable, but, you know, those are scary statistics, and criminals are going to look into every single one of those to see what they can do. They really try to hit us wherever we have any kind of challenges. So let's kind of look over the challenges that we face, all of us. So we have evolving technology, and that's great, right? But every single one of those is a complex attack surface that they can exploit. And then on top of that, do we really understand, you know, what it does to our systems and what we're going to face in the short term, midterm, and long term? What effects is it going to have on our posture, on our cybersecurity posture? Additionally, we already have complex IT infrastructures. We have multiple networks that are interconnected. We have uh, many different devices that we use. We also have software applications that are brought in from all over the place. How do we really protect those? And then on top of that, if we integrate new technology into it, it makes it even more complex because, you know, we already have issues right now and then we're just going to add things on top of it. So we have great potential, but we need to be aware of the challenges that we face every time we integrate new things. We also have problems with cybersecurity skills not being readily available for most people. There's a shortage of cybersecurity professionals, unfortunately, and it's something that a lot of companies deal with. In fact, more than half of public companies state that this is one of their biggest challenges that they face in trying to be um, up to date with all of the compliance and regulations that they need to follow. We have cybercrime sophistication that is continuing to grow. Hackers are constantly um, integrating new procedures, new tactics. They're trying new things constantly. And it's kind of scary because we have to be right 100% of the time. They have to be right only once. Additionally, we have regulatory compliance which it's made to make us stronger and protect everyone that uses the systems. However, the problem is, is it very complex? It's not easy to follow those regulations and to be compliant with them, especially for companies that um, are multinational and work on very different uh, regulations that they, they will need to implement for every single one of those. Another one, finally, is the cyber inequality. Now, this is becoming one of the biggest ones that we are facing today. There is a huge gap between the people th or the businesses that are compliant and the businesses that are falling short. Unfortunately, the small and medium-sized businesses, which actually make up the most, you know, the majority of our economy, are the ones that are suffering the most the ones that are able to meet the minimum security compliance measures has dropped by 30% in the last year. This was a huge topic on the World Economic Forum's annual meeting on cybersecurity. And out of all of the 120 executives that were interviewed, 90% of them agreed that this is a critical issue that we need to address immediately. So what kind of attacks can we face? Well, many different types are completely endless, and I only listed a few of them. Criminals have a lot of tools at their disposal, and they use them constantly. 
phishing attacks. There was 1.7 billion of them last year. There was 317 million ransomware attacks, 15.4 million denial of service attacks. And then not to mention zero days, which of course has a huge market. You know, there's the brown and black markets out there and they go for millions of dollars. So hackers are definitely looking for those. So how devastating is this for us? Because typically it's not a question of if you're going to be attacked, it's when you're going to be attacked. So what are we looking at? Well, 45% of experts say that they fear cyber attacks more than they do natural disasters or even energy concerns. And it's easy to see why. They're very, very expensive. So the cost of a cyber attack is usually 4.4 million dollars. And for critical infrastructure, it's more with 4.8 million dollars. And then additionally, besides the cost of it, our most important asset, which is data, can potentially be lost or completely locked away. We can't do anything without our data. We can't pay our employees. We can't do our normal operations. And unfortunately, that leads us to the next one, operational disruption. There's nothing we can do without our data. And we've seen this example a lot throughout the years. Additionally, there's legal implications. Of course, if you have a cyber attack, not only are you dealing with that, but you're going to be investigated. You're going to have to prove what you did beforehand, what safety regulations you had, what happened during that attack, and what were the ramifications after that attack. What did you do to stop the attack, and how did you what did you do moving forward? You know, that's, that's a lot, especially depending on the different agencies. You might be doing this for multiple, which can be very expensive and very time consuming. Um, this year, they are set to implement the NIST II directive in Europe. Now, this one is m supposed to bolster the cybersecurity across Europe, but it puts a lot of the burden of securing our systems on the companies themselves. And the reason they're doing that is simple, because that's the only thing they can do. We can't stop the criminals. We've tried. It's hard. It's hard to stop normal criminals, let alone, you know, the ones that cause cyber attacks. And the NIST II directive is one of those that brings the liability into the boardrooms with very serious fines and even um, jail time for not following them. So unfortunately, between the operational loss, the legal implications, you're going to suffer a lot financially, which can be very, very devastating. And then how do you recover? Well, your reputation's been damaged. Unfortunately, you know, it, it's a horrible side effect. And 60% of small businesses that have undergone a cyber attack will usually go out of business within six months. But it, it's hard to recover, and it's very, very devastating. And then unfortunately for critical infrastructure, you also have the potential for harm or loss of life. So what do we do about it? Well, there's strength in partners. Partnerships and uniting together is about the only way that we can actually protect ourselves from this. I mean, we have a generalized norm that we typically follow that says inequality is healthy competition. We want that inequality. We want to be better. We, you know, we always compete against each other. The problem is, is that our digital ecosystem is so intertwined and so fragile that we can't afford to keep doing this. It is going to compound and eventually affect everybody. And to a point it already has, but it's only continue to continue to get worse. There's a saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I mean, aren't we all in it for the long game? We want to go far and we want to be strong. And the only way to do it is together. And the reasons are pretty simple. So individually, we can't compete. 
we have limited visibility. We can't see all the different cyber attacks. We can't know all the vulnerabilities out there. And we need to have insights from people from different industries, different sectors, different experiences. They can also bring in personal experiences. And we can improve things from their experiences. We also all have resource constraints. Unfortunately, no matter what company you're in, you're always going to have resource constraints. Um, and then cybersecurity, additionally on top of it, is very expensive and very you know, resource you know, extensive. So you're going to have to have skilled personnel, you're going to have to have integrated technology, and you're going to have to constantly be testing and upgrading your systems. And then, of course, the complexities and interdependencies. No company operates by themselves. We have hardware from one company, services from another company, software from another company. We can't operate by ourselves, and additionally, we can't protect ourselves just by ourselves. We also have the rapidly evolving threats. We all know that hackers don't operate alone. They use each other's knowledge and technology and just grow on top of it. And unfortunately, that's a huge threat that we're facing. The only way to win is actually to do this together. We need to be able to share threat intelligence. We need to share insights. Not only will that help us gather all the knowledge that we need to, to be able to understand the kind of threats that we're having, the kind of um, problems that we're facing, but additionally, it helps us learn that where we can fix these problems at. We can improve our best practices. Because, I mean, honestly, we have amazing technology. But unless we actually bring the people into it, integrating a new technology is not going to just fix it. We need to work together to be able to improve our best practices, make sure that we're having security implemented from the very start of a project to the very end of the project and continued ongoing constantly. We need to leverage each other's expertise. There is some very, very smart people in every single company, and they all have qualities and expertise that we can learn from, that we can integrate into ours. Not only will it help us with resources, because now it's not just on us. We have other people so we can learn faster and adapt quicker and be able to mitigate these threats a lot faster. Additionally, we can build some strong solutions together. We can't do it all, obviously. But we're not going to be able to specialize in everything. There are so many different APIs, layers, connection points, networks, services. Everything is interconnected, and we need to start looking at it that way. No company is going to be able to protect itself. Additionally, it'll help with compliance because the NIST 2 directive, you are um, liable for all of your supply chain. Well, you're going to need partnerships in order to be able to be compliant with that. In order to truly secure yourself, you need to be able to work with the partners and be able to trust who you're working with. That is the only way that we'll be able to really protect ourselves and be able to respond to the cyber threats that we have out there. Cybersecurity is a team sport. We should no longer be at competition. We should build this as a team sport and work together to build the solutions and build the technology that we really need to be able to protect ourselves. And when you're doing that, you don't want just any partners. You want partners that work well together that are able to you know, promote each other and be able to be there even when the chips are down. Even when there's problems, you want someone that will answer the phone and help you at your worst. So I'm going to introduce Brad and let him take over because we've had a partnership with Mainsail and I believe that our collaboration together is the perfect example of what 
true partnership can actually accomplish. Thank you. So everything that Heidi was talking about with you know attacks becoming more advanced, um, you know the different categories that are out there, the different layers that attackers are going after, um, we're no longer seeing that just software solutions alone can actually defend against uh, a lot of these nation state style attacks. And especially if we start talking about, you know, probably everyone's favorite topic right now of AI, right? So using large language models to basically lower the bar for someone to become almost an expert hacker overnight. So this really means that you have to not only think about what you're doing at the application layer, but really taking a defense in depth approach. Right? So this means actually threat modeling the entire stack, right? making sure that if one control fails, you have something that's going to be there to block or mitigate. So this is a stack that we put together. Okay? So I'm going to start with a lot of the, the rancher stuff on top, because a lot of the stuff that they're doing, they're experts in protecting containerized workloads. Um, and really the threat model around containers. So to, from the basis that we started with was SLE Micro, right, as a hardened immutable operating system. Um, then we then put RKE2 on top, which is a hardened version of Kubernetes, so it's enforcing uh, FIPS compliance. Um, and then we put Rancher on top for container management. And then Longhorn for storage. So you know, having the data, making sure that that is uh, encrypted while it's at rest, and then also highly available in case you have failures in the cluster. And then to protect the containerized workloads, we have new vector that is actually able to look for things like signs of container compromise. And we really like new vector a lot for this because this is really their domain expertise is protecting containerized workloads. Then we come to Metalvisor. So this is our, our product from Mainsail. Metalvisor is what we call a type zero hypervisor, or really it's a firmware-based hypervisor. Um, so you know, it's, it's kind of a new architecture, but that's, really, that's kind of a feature. It's not really its main job. Its main job is low-level threat protection. right? So a lot of the things that Heidi was talking about with buffer overflows, zero days, side channel attacks, specter meltdown, all of these types of things that are actually going after literal hardware vulnerabilities, things that are um, either very hard to patch or very hard to detect and very hard to block, right? Um, if you look at all of the zero days that are coming out, they are, for the most part, about 80% of them are using some type of memory corruption, some type of buffer overflow. So that's literally how an attacker is going to get a foothold and then start doing things like ransomware or any other you know, malicious activities. So our product, at a fundamental level, is built to stop these advanced attacks. Right? So when we run this stack and we have our Kubernetes running, we have Rancher, we have New Vector on top, blocking a lot of high-level application issues right? or any, any security vulnerabilities that come up, at a very low level, at the hardware level, we're actually looking for signs of you know, indicators of compromise, looking for memory corruption, all of these types of things. And what we're able to do is, by policy, we can take action against um, it, when we do see things like buffer overflows, stack exploits, um, side channel attacks. So depending on what the policy is, we can either alert or we can actually halt that action from happening. So this is all policy-based, right? So we're talking about a, a, a skills gap in cybersecurity, right? The skills gap is not going to stop an attacker from getting root on a box, right? It's just not. Okay, so we have to make this as simple as possible for, for the end user to use. And honestly, these things are very advanced, right? To, to be able to protect against you know, stack-level exploits, there's a lot of configurations you have to do, and maybe you stop it, right? Well, here's just another tool in your toolbox you can use to basically stop these types of attacks. So basically what we've done is really kind of separate out our, our layers of concern. So when we're talking about 
things like container escapes and different other types of exploits we're looking at, maybe through the supply chain or, or you know, compromised libraries inside of a container. These are all things that new vector is definitely going to catch and be able to stop, right? So this is really a great marriage between, you know, running secure containers, but what about your hardware? What about your firmware? What about your BIOS, right? These are all things that kind of are an afterthought, afterthought for a lot of people. Um, but this is literally what we're doing is, you know, by default, is securing against a lot of these low-level threats. So one of the other things that we're also doing is turning this entire cluster into a confidential compute cluster. So if you're not familiar with confidential compute, it's basically the, the encryption of data while it's in use. So we use a thing called multi-key total memory encryption. So every virtual machine that we spin up is getting encrypted with its own unique encryption key. And that opens up a lot of different things from a, um, you know, from a security standpoint to just really harden the cluster but also if we're talking about edge-based workloads, right, which is where I think a lot of people are very interested right now. Um, one of the big attacks that you can do to an edge device is literally just take that memory out of that box, put it into another one, and you'd be able to, you'd be, if it's unencrypted, you'll be able to see all of that data, right? So having total memory encryption actually uh, prevents those types of attacks. And when we're talking about, you know, reducing the threats, the, the surface area for attack. You know, we're very small in size, being, you know, firmware-based hypervisor. Um, and then this whole stack working together, you know, only, you know, going into the future, we plan on, you know, tighter integrations with monitoring and all of these other types of things. But um, this is something that, you know, can be a turnkey security um, product that is really going to block many of those advanced threats. Right, and I think that's really the key here is, is the turnkey portion of this because to really go and build something else like this, you know, you're looking at bringing together multiple vendors and other, other agents and other things, right? For, for us to make confidential computing, stopping low-level exploits, spectrum meltdown, buffer overflows, all of these types of things, um, just a, another feature of the product, right? So we're trying to simplify this for the end user. So... I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow in the same room at 2 o'clock where I'm actually going to really deep dive into this, into the product. We also have some demos. And uh, one of the, the other things I kind of forgot to mention is one of the things we call this is self-defending infrastructure. Because, you know, if you're losing machines to an exploit and ransomware encryption or those types of things, it's very hard for that to stand that infrastructure back up and continue to operate. Well, that's what I'm going to show tomorrow is being able to operate through adversity, right? Even under active exploitation, still being able to keep the operations up and running. Thank you.